Hello, and welcome to another Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. I'm your host, Tom Brady, the Associate Dean of the Homeland Security Training Institute here at the College of DuPage. And every time we do a podcast, we like to talk about relevant topics in Homeland Security, things related to emergency response, things related to what's going on in the world. There's always a lot to talk about. And today I have a, a good friend and a, and a person who's an adjunct faculty for the Homeland Security Training Institute, uh, Mr. Mike Fagel. And, and, and Mike is also an expert in terrorism, um, emergency response. He's been in a lot of critical uh, responses um, throughout his career. And he's a great guy, and he agreed to come on the podcast today to talk a, a little bit about what's going on with terrorism currently in the world. And first, I'd like to welcome uh, to the HSTI podcast, Mike Fagel. Hey, Mike, welcome. Good morning. Thanks, Tom. Glad to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to have you. Um, we've done a lot of things together in the past in terms of teaching, and, and I'm always uh, I'm always happy to get you uh, um, teaching, or especially today on the on this podcast. Um, so, Mike, for the for the listening audience, could you tell a little bit about about yourself and your background? Well, Tom, I've been uh, in emergency planning, emergency management for almost forty years. I uh, started as a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, emergency manager, industrial safety. And I've been overseas on several for several organizations, and somehow it just grew and grew and grew. I spent 10 years at FEMA as a reservist. I teach intelligence courses for a couple agencies, universities, and here I am. Well, that's great. I know that you've also been on the boots on the ground at a couple of uh, major um, critical incidents uh, in the history of the United States. Can you talk a little bit about them? Yes, sir. My first uh, boots on the ground was Oklahoma City bombing, April 19th, 1995. That really was the turning point in my career. I moved from that point from being an on-the-street firefighter, police officer, sheriff's deputy, and it turned turned me into doing something a lot more, more disaster planning, more disaster management, because that was truly a, a watershed event, a turning point. And then I was at September 11th, 9-11, for three months. I was working with the U.S. Department of Justice, and I was assigned there as a safety officer for the fire department of New York. And that also, Tom, has, again, was a watershed event for me. Up until September 11th, my mind was full of working in Oklahoma City, trying to train people about that. Then when 9-11 happened, my whole world turned totally different, turned upside down. I was on the scene, uh, arrived on September 12th, and the scenes, the graphic images, I can pull those up in my head right now, seeing what I saw. And um, again, I was there till Christmas. That event still sticks in my mind as probably the most difficult missions I've ever been on. I was a safety officer, logistics officer. Uh, I found things we needed to make the rescue better, uh, you know, from cutting torches to body bags to American flags. Uh, the mission was so all encompassing uh, to this day, still right in the front of my mind. And Mike, are those so those two incidents that you described? Um, are those? It seems to me like in talking to you, those are, those are the things that drive you. Those incidents have, have driven you to be where you are today and do what you do today, which is really really important. And 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 we greatly appreciate what you do. But it seems to me like those have been the, the drivers. That Oklahoma City was a turning point for you, and and, and from there, nine eleven um, kind of continued that turning point for you. Absolutely, Tom. And you're right. It was a driver on September eleventh. The world changed. The world changed dramatically. We all know we were at 9.02 a.m. And uh, on my team, of my teammates that were there on September 11th, of the 12 of us, 10 of my teammates are now dead. They've died from illnesses. Uh, I have an illness from, from Ground Zero as well. I received uh, the same type of cancer. All my teammates, had, every one of us, had the same exact cancer symptoms. And luckily, mine was found early, knock on wood, but uh, it still left other elements. And Tom, that really drives me. Every day I'm here on this earth is a gift. And if I can take and share with somebody, sometimes someplace, one element that may save a life someplace down the road, that's why I'm here. And, and you've seen me work. You've seen my textbooks. My textbooks are labors of getting stuff on paper so mm -hmm. people can use those. Uh, you know, if you've written books, you know how difficult it is to put things on paper. But 
when I was writing about September 11, that just flowed, mm -hmm. and it's inspired. Uh, I was teaching in a police academy a couple of weeks ago, and people said, I've got your book. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool when people say, I know you. I don't know you personally, but I know you. And they went back, got the book, and had me sign it. That's kind of cool yeah. just to see that. So, uh, Tom, that's what drives me. That's what really drives me. Yeah, well, and, and you know what? I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry you had to go through the health issues. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're doing the things you're doing. And, you know, it's, it's been a great partnership having you uh, on, on the faculty. Um, let's talk a little bit about the events uh, last week in, uh, in Manchester. Um, because we're seeing come somewhat of a, I think, a, of, a, of a change with uh, terrorist activity. Um, this one obviously targeted uh, youth, you know, children and, 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 you know, teens that were at a concert. Um, it seems like the terrorists are always kind of changing their, uh, you know, their, their, their attack mode um, to, to try to either shock or, or to, to surprise people. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that. Now, we've, we've talked about, I know that you've, you've done a lot of writing and you have a book on soft targets. Uh, can you explain, first of all, before we start getting into the, the Manchester incident, what, uh, what is a soft target? So, Tom, a soft target is pretty much almost anything that is not a military installation. You know, we think of a soft target now could be a church, a school, hospital, could be a college, could be a high school, grade school could be a bank. It could be anything where people gather. You know, you think of a hardened target would be a federal building, a military installation, something that really takes security to the, to the nth degree. But today, a soft target could be any event. You know, the nightclub in Orlando, the public health building where they had uh, the San Bernardino attack. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a, a venue. So in reality, Tom, in my, in my view, Everything's a soft target, mm -hmm. unless it's been specifically designed and hardened. So a daycare center could be a soft target. A bus stop, uh, picture people milling about going to the airport and uh, standing in line before they go through security. That's a soft target, a train station. Uh, so I guess, Tom, nothing's immune. And, and that's the part that scares me the most is that the bad guys know that. Mm -hmm. And the bad guys are always, always adapting learning, and every time there's an attack, someone someplace is keeping a scorecard, and they're saying, this didn't work, let's try this. Well, it's a, that's a great uh, explanation of what a soft target is, and I want to talk a little bit more about soft targets here, but I also want to talk about the, the incident in Manchester. So what, what's your thoughts on that? Are, are terrorists changing their, um, their targets? Are they crossing the line? I mean, obviously, they've crossed the line many times, but is this, is this something that's, that's a little bit different? It is, and and you're right. The line, in my humble opinion, has been crossed when they attack children, when they attack eight-year-olds and seven-year-olds and families going to have an enjoyable event, that they have no other reasons for these people to be attacked other than the bad guys don't like our way of life. And the lines that have been crossed, uh, look at Omar Mateen, look at San Bernardino, look at every event the lines keep getting blurred and blurred and blurred. And <clears throat> there's two terms. One's an inspired attack and one's a directed attack. And remember, after every event, the ISIS or AQAP will take a note and say, you know, that was one of our soldiers. That's what we did. And people now are reading so much on the Internet. They're getting so many magazines, so many uh, and there's a magazine called Inspire. You know, mm -hmm. Don't look this up at home, folks, because Inspire, you don't know who's touching that magazine. So be careful when you surf. But Inspire tells people how to do these things. You know, The May 2010 issue, which sticks in my mind, was how to build a bomb in the kitchen of your mom. Mm -hmm. And it showed the Chicago skyline. It talks about taking a snowplow and, and making it, making it a, a deadly delivery vehicle. Look what happened in Nice last year. Mm -hmm. So... Every time there's an attack, the people who think they want to get their jihad and, and get themselves to whatever their goal is, they use these tools. And every time you see the truck attack mm -hmm. or the weaponry attack or the machete attack, the bad guys just get emboldened. And the people have been trained. They've gone overseas. We've got American citizens who've been arrested for material support to ISIS or AQAP. Mm -hmm. Every state has an, has an investigation going on right now. 
So people are still traveling. And, you know, just this week there was a New Jersey soldier arrested. So it continues to grow. So terrorists are looking for vulnerabilities. And let me let me clarify. Anytime there's a terrorist attack, that's crossing the line because people are, are hurt. People are killed. There's 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 no place in the world for these types of things. So I, I want to clarify that. But they're looking for, I think, different vulnerabilities when we talk about these soft targets. Just last week in Manchester was a, a group of uh, teens and tweens and whatever you call them and kids. They were at, at a concert um, and obviously they were targeted. Um, what are some things that we can do to protect ourselves from this? Now, we've talked about soft targets and what they are, but how do you protect yourself or how can we collectively as a society or as, as a world protect ourselves from these types of attacks? Well, Tom, one thing that we're, we've are we done here at COD is develop a SAR course, Suspicious Activities, and we'll be delivering that again soon. And the SAR course talks about profiling actions, not people. So we don't want people to profile a person because profiling is, is not a legitimate tool, but actions are. For example, if you see someone who is uh, gaining knowledge, they're at a gun range, and if you take a look at Cho when he did the killing at Virginia Tech, the gun range people saw him with taking targets, laying them on the ground, and shooting targets on the ground as if he was dispatching people that way. That was what behavior he used when he attacked Virginia Tech. So if people see that type of behavior going, that's suspicious, that just doesn't look right. And I guess that's the key. We don't want people to be vigilantes. We want them to be vigilant. Mm -hmm. And when things just don't stack up, going, this person is acquiring weapons, this person is acquiring knowledge and skills, this person is going to the hardware store and looking to buy bomb making materials like Timothy McVeigh right. in 1995. So those are suspicious things. I was at the grain elevator where McVeigh bought the materials two years ago, giving a presentation there. And these people still feel guilty about them selling McVeigh, the ammonium nitrate fertilizer, 15 years ago. So it's there and people have the ability to see things and potentially observe behavior. People may elicit illicit behavior. They may, for example, say, how many police cars do you have? Or they may go to a website and go, welcome to the town of XYZ. We have 55 officers. We have 17 fire stations, whatever it might be. They're using this data to go, I'm going to pick that as a target because they may be less prepared. Mm -hmm. So for us to observe suspicious activities and behaviors is critical. Well, let's talk about that for a second, Mike, because, you know, we, we both have experience um, in our past in law enforcement. And it's I think it's a little bit, you know, kind of I don't wouldn't say easier, but I think we're, we're more adept at seeing something that may be amiss or, or something because that's what we've done. But what about the average citizen? And we talk about, well, you know, we, we always hear if you see something, say something well, to the average citizen. What? What would trigger that, that they think something's out of, out of the ordinary? You know what I mean? For, for people that don't have that experience that we have. Exactly. It's, a, it's an awareness. It's a common operating picture, you know, we talk about on scenes. But it's people understanding if things just don't start to stack up. Everybody says after an event, go, I knew that person. They were doing something that was a little bit weird. You know, after the San Bernardino attacks, people said, well, they were making stuff in their garage. Or we saw people acquiring knowledge. Omar Mateen uh, was a level four security officer who had long rifle training and handgun training, and he had permission to, to, to go to those training exercises. So he knew these things. So when people start doing things and they just sound not correct, you hear people talking about, you know what, I want to do X, or I want to do Y, or I want to do Z, or they start to inquire and elicit data that they just don't need to know. Mm -hmm. Those are things. There's 16 elements on the on the SAR course that we, we teach here at COD. And some of those elements are elicitation, gaining information. Another element is acquiring expertise. Another is acquiring weaponry. Every element may be criminal, but it may not be terrorism, mm -hmm. or it might be vice versa. So people need to try and stack these things up. And when you get two or three things stacked up on the same bin going, wow, this is something that really looks like it may be untoward. So they call the state fusion centers and let those people know because they're trained for intake. 
an average 911 center also gets these calls, and they forward these up the food chain, up to the fusion center, and go, I now have a suspicious activity report, and they start to stack them up going, you know what, this is the third time I heard about that white Chevrolet, mm -hmm. you know, at the, at the gun range with people acting weird. Right. That's how, that's one way to do it. Well, I think that, you know, the providing information to, to the authorities or law enforcement by the general public is important because it may just be a piece to the puzzle. And that's really what you're talking about, I think. You know, the, the police uh, departments and, and law enforcement and really anyone in public safety who works in this area, they're trying to put intelligence together so they can prevent something from happening. So they may get one piece from someone and maybe another piece from someone else and maybe another piece from someone else someone else that may seem unrelated, but in fact, they are related, you know, and it could just be pieces of the puzzle. So I think there is um, a logic to people reporting something that they see that might be amiss. Maybe it turns out to be not a piece of the puzzle, but it's better to report that than not to report it. Is that correct? Well, I, I agree. For example, in Washington, D.C., everybody's taking a picture of something. There's monuments everywhere. But if you're a trained observer, you see people focusing on that security device, that camera, that door lock, that hinge. That may say, wow, what are they doing here? Mm -hmm. uh, and people can surreptitiously take pictures now with their cell phones that they don't see a zoom lens anymore, but they look like they're shooting a picture of you or I with a backdrop. In reality, they're zooming past us, focusing on that piece of security, that security officer. Or they're doing dry runs to determine if I pull the fire alarm, what will happen? How many people will show up? Where will they stage? And it gives me a clue as to what their response might be. So all these tools are out there, and we've got to just build on those and just continue to reinforce that we are the key. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, Mike. When does a soft target? I've thought about. I've I've often thought about this, and I'm just not really sure what the answer is. But when is a soft target? When you start adding security to it and, and hardening it, when does a, a soft target move from being a, 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 so, a soft target, if you will, to the definition of a hard target, which would be a, a government facility that's completely uh, secure? Um, is that the direction that we're moving in, or do, can a soft target actually become a hard target? You, you can harden it. So, for example, let's just say we have building A and building B. Both do the same thing. They're both whatever their business is. One building has a fence. One building has a security culture. So if you picture the hard target as the center of the bullseye, and you build concentric rings outside this area, and you build zones of security, mm -hmm. one of them, first thing, is culture, and it's procedures. And people see that, wait a minute, building A has gates, has guards, has a security quotient, has cameras, has lighting. Then you see building B right next door that has none of these things. They're going to go, well, I think I'm going to attack building B because building B, I've got a higher chance of success. So when we harden a target, we push people to the softer targets. But if you draw that bullseye, so if you would just, if our readers or listeners would just draw a bullseye of whatever that target they're protecting, and the center of that bullseye is the element that people want to get to. We take our rings and draw them out, draw them out, draw them out like a bullseye. Every ring is a zone of security. Mm -hmm. and, and Tom, it's a culture. It's an awareness. And, right. and the awareness is the one thing we've got, people to, we've got to get people to really understand that awareness is the key as they try and put these pieces together. Right. So it, it is possible to protect a, a soft target. But I think for the reason you mentioned earlier, a soft target is, is, is a is a place where people want to come. They they want they want to be there to to kind of get away from reality for a little bit, a theater, or whatever it may be. And and if you if it's completely hardened, then people may not be apt to go there. They may not want to go there. They may feel not as um, I guess away from reality as as, as they'd like to be. So that's going to be comfortable. It's going to be it's going to be a con con continuous challenge, I think, to be able to protect these places. But I think using the 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 concentric circles around a, a target of security is, is the way to go. And do you think, based upon the conversation, do you think we are building a culture of security here in the United States collectively? Collectively, Tom, probably not as much as we should. Remember, September 11th was that watershed event. And September 11th, for a year or two, people thought about security and people, there was 100% ID checks and there was jersey barriers in front of buildings and there was a, an armed presence of trained officers. Then as September 11th got farther and farther away in the rearview mirror, 
those things started to drop again. Mm -hmm. They started to fall off. And I believe those are elements that the bad guys are able to see. Sure. And our society is built on freedoms. Our Constitution is a wonderful thing that is a tool that the bad guys also see. They use our freedoms. They use our ability here as a society to attack us at our vulnerabilities. Um, you know, schools, we're seeing more school attacks, mm -hmm. more people doing those type of heinous acts. And I believe that it's just a matter of time. I hope it never happens. Honest to gosh, I hope it never happens. But I believe it's a matter of time before the bad guys attack a school or a school bus and attack, and attack our children. And that will be another watershed event mm -hmm. because... One thing that's dear, near and dear to us is our kids. Mm -hmm. Of course. And a shopping mall. Look at Black Friday. Look at the Thursday or the Friday after after Christmas when people are lined up to get that $5 toaster. Well, what would be an ideal spot if you're a bad guy to attack a mall? What would that do to commerce? What would they do to commerce nationwide? And bad guys want to show us that they're in charge, and they're not. We yeah, are. but, but Mike, as a, as a society, we, we can't change. We can't not do those things because we're we're afraid you know and, and i think that's the challenge because we don't as a society we want to continue to live um and uh, enjoy the freedoms that we have um so i don't know where the you know where the where the fine line is in terms of um stopping doing what we're doing stop doing uh, uh the living our way of life because we're afraid that's a great point i don't have the answer either because we don't want to stop doing what we're doing. We don't want to be anything but our free society. And the bad guys know that. They capitalize on that. And right now, it's death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. We don't know when that next shoe is going to drop. Look what we've done to air travel since September 11th. Look at right. the changes. And look at the, the things we're talking about now where they want to uh, take laptops out of your devices and no longer travel overseas with laptops. You know, some European countries have said no more laptops come to the U.S. So things are changing on a regular basis, and TSA is adapting and adapting and adapting. Mm -hmm. But so are the bad guys. They know every procedure. They know every rule that we have because they're public. They're published. Right. And it's not hard to believe that there's bad guys in any one of these groups. Well, hopefully we'll continue to be proactive as a society and stay out in front of these things. Um, I think that's the best way to protect ourselves. We have to anticipate what may occur and, and make sure that we identify those vulnerabilities and, 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 and take care of them. Exactly. And, you know, what we're doing at COD, it's education. Mm -hmm. We are an educational institution, and education is a key. We also do training, and the two words are not the same. Education and training are similar but not the same. And where we can serve the public that we serve is by giving them education on these subjects and train them. Give them both pieces of the puzzle and let them be better prepared right. to make these observations. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We're almost out of time, Mike, but I do have one more question. Now, you've been in emergency management and public safety for a long time. Um, great career. You've, you've been in a lot of critical incidents and responses. Um, is there anything that's, that's, that surprises you anymore? That's a great question, Tom. Uh, I thought I'd seen everything. Uh, I guess I haven't. Nothing surprises me, Tom, anymore. Because emergency management, we're coordination for when the event happens. We provide support to the people who are on the ground. And I thought Oklahoma City bombing was the worst thing I'd ever seen. Then I saw uh, September 11th. I've been overseas. I've been in the Middle East. I've been all over the world. But, Tom, nothing really surprises me much anymore, which is kind of scary because we don't know what the next event's going to be and how it's going to unfold. Well, Mike, great conversation. I want to thank you for coming on the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. It, uh, it was a great conversation. I, I've, I've learned a lot, and it was great to be able to pick your mind a little bit and, and talk about how we can protect ourselves better as a society. So thank you for coming on. You're welcome, sir. So as we, as we close the show, I want to thank everyone for, for listening. Continue to subscribe to the HSTI podcast. We're available on iTunes, and we're always adding uh, new content. And we're going to continue to do that because I think this is such an important uh, area and topic for discussion. Until next time, everyone take care. Stay safe. This is Tom Brady. We'll see you next time.